Okay, I'm about to introduce a guy who doesn't need an introduction. Many remember him from some news group post like many, many years ago. Most of you will own at least one book of him. And I present to you Andrew Tenbaum. Thank you, but wait, maybe you won't like the talk. Uh, OK, um, I'm going to talk about Minix 3. Um, currently, the mode is a re-implementation of NetBSD using a microkernel. And I'm you know, Andrew Tannenbaum, but my students did all the work, actually, my programmers. Um, OK, the, um, the goal of the project is to build a reliable operating system. So let's start with my definition of a reliable operating system. Okay. An operating system is said to be reliable when a typical user has never experienced even a single failure in his or her lifetime and does not know anybody who's ever experienced a failure. <laughs> okay. um, in engineering terms, this probably means something like mean time to failure of like 50 years. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Let me describe what I think of as the television model, okay? at least old style TVs. It's getting less so. Um, you buy the television, uh, you plug it in, and it works perfectly for the next 10 years. Okay? Now let's look at the computer model, <laughs> um, Windows edition. Okay? You buy the computer, um, you plug it in. Now we're 2 thirds of the way there. Okay, it's just this little part about it works perfectly for the next 10 years. That's a little bit different. Um, first, you install service packs 1 through 9F. <laughs> then you install 18 new emergency security patches that happened after 9F. And then you find and install seven new device drivers. And then you install the antivirus software. Then you install the anti-spyware software. Then you install the anti-hacker software. Then you install the anti-spam software. Then you reboot the computer. <laughs> okay. But I'm not done yet. I just ran out of space on the slide. So there's more. It doesn't work. <laughs> See, you call the help desk. Okay. You wait on hold for 30 minutes. Okay. They tell you to reinstall Windows. <laughs> which is what you're trying to do in the first place. Okay. <clears throat> the typical user reaction to this is something like this. Uh, I saw a story in the New York Times which said that 25% of computer, use, computer users have actually gotten so angry they hit the computer. Um, most of them don't know where the computer is, though. This is the monitor, you know, which is not where the problem is. Anyway, so um, you might say, is reliability so important? Who cares if it works or not? Um, it's annoying when it doesn't work, and you might lose some work if it goes down. But also think about other situations, like industrial process control systems in factories. Think about power grids when their computer doesn't work. Think about hospital operating systems, hospital operating rooms when um, the power, you know, the computer doesn't work. Think about banking and e-commerce servers. What happens if that doesn't work? Or emergency phone centers, or you know, control software in cars and airplanes and places like that. Um, so. There are places where it actually matters whether it works or not. Okay? So the question is, is it feasible? Is it possible to make software you know, and hardware that works? Well, first of all, we won't find out if we don't really try. And so um, the Dutch Royal Academy gave me 2 million euros to try. So I said, thank you very much. We'll, we'll try. Uh, <laughs> and then the European Union, I have an ERC advance grant, if you know what that is, for 2.5 million euros to give it a shot. So um, we're trying. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Royal Academy, and thank you very much, uh, European Research Council. The first question is, is reliability achievable at all? Is this even possible? Well, systems can actually survive hardware failures. For example, um, RAIDs can survive a failed disk. The disk dies, and if your RAID is properly working, the system merrily continues even with a dead disk. Because there's some redu redundancy in there, and there's parity, you know, there's algorithms, RAID 1, RAID 2, and so on. You can survive a failed disk if configured properly. 
ECC memory can survive parity errors in memory because they have, you know, that redundancy basically using a Hamming code, and they can survive memory errors. TCP IP can survive lost packets because there's an acknowledgement algorithm. And if you send the packet, don't get an acknowledgement, you send it again, keep doing it until you get an acknowledgement. So um, you can do that. CD-ROM drives, you know, CD-ROM blanks and, and DVDs and Blu-rays, about three quarters of the bits are actually error correcting bits. It's a very complicated scheme where they code, use 14 bits to code eight bits, and then there's these 2K sectors, and it's multiple levels of redundancy, so they can recover from a very large number of errors, because the disks are stamped mechanically. It's not that bad. Uh, maybe it is, I don't know. Um, you can recover from hardware errors and many errors. So, you know, you think that software errors ought to be doable if you can recover from, you know, fatal hardware errors. This requires organizing your software a little bit differently, okay? Um, so I think operating systems research, which is sort of, you know, community I'm in, needs to be refocused a little bit. Um, we have basically nearly infinite hardware on PC class machines. An ordinary PC, a BIOS, there now, has got, compared to like where we were 10 or 20 years ago, this is basically infinite, okay? Um, there's lots of CPU cycles, there's lots of RAM, there's lots of bandwidth. Um, current software has tons of useless features that nobody wants, having to do with the economics of the software business, of, you know, version 14 has to have more features than version 13, even nobody has used any feature beyond version 7, but they've got to add new features because that's where they sell it, okay? Um, so the software is slow and bloated and buggy. And, you know, um, to achieve what I would call the TV model, I think future operating systems need to be changed somehow. They have to be smaller, they have to be simpler, they have to be modular, which is very important, they have to be more reliable, and um, they have to be secure. And I think self-healing. I think self-healing is a key word. They have to look for their own errors and try to fix them on the fly. And that's what our research has sort of been focused on. Let me give you a very brief history of um, the work we've been doing for about, I don't know, since 1987, I think. 1976, a professor named John Lyons at New South Wales in Australia wrote a book on Unix version 6. When, when version 6 came out, he wrote this commentary on it, sort of like commentaries on the Bible or something. And then AT&T, in its brilliance, when it came out with, you know, version 7, had a clause in there saying, thou shalt not write a book about version 7. You know, God forbid that students all over the world learn about their product. We cannot tolerate this. So they did that. In 85, I said, maybe I could rewrite you know, Unix on my own all by myself. It was, I, was I was young and crazy. I didn't know that it was hard. Um, so I did it. It took me two years. Um, long stories about that. But um, so I wrote it, and then I, I wrote a book about, you know, the software, and we released it, and it was free of AT&T code. And so all, the, soft, so all the, um, uh, the source code was out there, and people could do whatever they want with it. There was, there was some minor licensing initially, but basically it was available, certainly to universities and for non-commercial use. In 97, came out with another version, version 2, and a new book. And this was POSIX rather than version 7 compatible. And then 2000, we changed the license. The publisher, Prentice Hall, I had arguments with them, but they didn't understand software. Finally, in 2000, they gave up and said, just use the BSD. I said, I wanted to use the BSD license. They said, we don't know what it is, but do it. Um, 2004, I started um, working on this reliable you know, stuff. 2006 was the third edition of the book with Albert Woodhull. 2008, I got the European grant. And then we really started, I could hire programmers, and it got you know, more serious at that point. Um, and then um, the focus started moving toward embedded systems. So there's, um, you know, and then we moved toward NetBSD compatibility. Some of you may know that Linus Torvalds was one of the first Minix users and began changing it and changing it and changing it. Pretty soon, he you know, had his own system. So to some extent, you know, Linux is kind of a fork of, uh, of Minix. OK, there were three editions of the book. You know, I think the cover got better as time went on. Um, Okay, let me talk about intelligent design, um, at least as applied to operating systems. Um, you know, Minix is a microkernel. It's got about 15,000 lines of code. Um, most of them are, are C, a little bit of assembly code. And Linux has got 15 million lines. Uh, Windows is probably above 100 million lines now. It's really pretty bad. People have done studies of bugs, you know, in companies with their bug repositories and whatnot. And, you know, one bug per thousand lines of code is about the best you can do with really, you know, state-of-the-art techniques and, you know, code reviews and all things. If you can get um, down to one bug per thousand lines of code, you've done pretty well. If you got 15 million lines of code or 100 million lines of code, you do the arithmetic. Now, not all the bugs are serious. There may be spelling errors and messages and stuff, but some of them are always serious, right? I mean, these things are getting patched all the time because, you know, so Minix has got, you know, maybe 15 kernel bugs. Linux has got, you know, 
15,000. Windows has got you know a million. Um, it, there's a lot of bugs out there. And drivers, typically, if people have studied this, have three to seven times more bugs than everything else, because everybody wants to study the memory management code. And nobody wants to study you know, the Epson 2156 printer driver, which is you know, enormously complicated, et cetera. And, you know, 70% of the code is the drivers, and nobody ever looks at that. So although open source, in theory, people can look at it, in reality, nobody ever does. And in Windows, you know, nobody has the code except for Microsoft, and they're too busy. So I think what you need is like highly modular systems. You need the operating system to run basically as multiple user mode processes, not in the kernel. These things separated from each other. And so step one is to um, isolate the components very well. Okay, so move all the loadable modules and everything except the very, very hardcore kernel out of the kernel into user space. Okay, and that means all the drivers out, all the file systems out, memory management code out, run everyone out with a separate, as a separate process using the POLA, the principle of least authority. That is, don't give a component any more power to do damage than it actually needs to do its work. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. It's the principle of least authority, very important principle. Step two is isolate the I.O. Isolate all the I.O. devices. Um, limit access to the I.O. ports. You know, in a conventional everything in the kernel system, the audio driver has access to the disk. You know, it's not supposed to, but it, technically if it wants to, it can write on the disk. That has to be pr prohibited by putting each driver in a separate user mode process and restricting access to the I.O. ports. You've got to constrain the DMA so you can't DMA over somebody else's memory. Then you've got to isolate the communication. Um, you limit interprocess communication. You have to restrict the kernel calls on a per component, you know, need to use basis. Um, you got to restrict the interprocess communication. Not everybody can talk to everybody, but you can only talk to those other components that you need to talk to to get the work done. Um, make sure that a faulty receiver can't hang a, hang a faulty sender. So if A sends a message to B, you know, and then A doesn't wait for the reply, you don't want to hang B. So here's the architecture of, um, of Minix 3. Okay. In the kernel, running in you know, the actual kernel of the, you know, the kernel on the bare metal, is the microkernel. It handles interrupts. It handles process scheduling. It handles interprocess communication. It does not handle any of the device drivers. It does not handle memory management. It does not handle anything else. It's very, very bare bones stuff. That's still 15,000 lines of code. Okay? But that's just, you know, you're going to make all the I.O. devices. So, you know, there's stuff you've got to make work. You know, when an interrupt happens, certain things have to happen next so it can do the next step and, you know, the registers have to be saved. And it turns out there's a lot of that stuff. Okay. And uh, there's a little bit of scheduling you have to do at the bottom. You got to manage the MMU. There's some stuff you got to do in the kernel. But it's only about 15,000 lines of code if you're careful. And L4, which is a comparable system, is also about this size, you know, somewhere in the 15,000 line thing. The next level, which are all user mode processes, are the I.O. devices. Okay? So the disk driver, the terminal driver, the network driver, the printer driver, all the drivers, each one runs as a separate user mode process with the MMU turned on. It's limited you know, what it can do in terms of accessing physical you know, resources and so on. Um, uh, then at the next level are the servers, which are sort of the real operating system, the file server, possibly multiple ones, process server. <coughs> memory servers, things that actually are what we normally think of as the operating system, each running as a separate process. And the top layer are just the regular, you know, POSIX programs, okay? So this is sort of the architecture of the, the system. Now, user mode device drivers, each driver runs as a user mode process, protected by the MMU. Um, you know, it doesn't have any super user power, just a regular old user process. Um, it's protected, you know, the MMU is turned on, so it can't get out of its address space. It does not even have access to the I.O. ports. So the disk driver can't even write on the disk. You know, it's got to ask the kernel. It's going to make a kernel call saying, here, here's a bunch of registers, here's a bunch of values. Go write these values in those registers. The kernel first checks, is this allowed? And if it's allowed, it doesn't. It. If it's not allowed, it gets back an error message saying no permission. So the disk driver can write on the disk, but if the audio driver tries to write on the disk, it gets back an e-no-perm e kind of message, and it can't do it. Um, the servers are in uh, user space. Each server runs as a separate process. Um, some of the key servers are the virtual file server, so you can have multiple file systems. There's the actual file systems. There's the process manager, does most of the work managing processes. The memory manager figures out you know, who goes where in memory. Um, there's the network server. And there's a thing called the reincarnation server, which I'll come to later. 
which is an interesting little beast. It brings back the dead. Um, here's a simplified example of um, some of the stuff. So here's what happens if you try to read something from you know, your read system call, POSIX call, and you know, you're lucky because the block you want happens to be in the file system's cache. Okay? So the user makes a call to the file system. That little colored thing under FS, that's the file system's cache. File system checks, is the block I need in the cache? No, if it's lucky, the answer is yes. And it calls the kernel and says, you know, go copy that block to the user, copies the block to the user, and everybody's happy. Okay? So that's the easy case. The harder case is the block is not in the cache. Okay? So now the user calls the file system. The file system calls the disk driver saying, go read that block and put it over here. Um, the disk driver you know, calls the kernel saying, I want to do disk I.O. here are the parameters. Checks it. If it's valid, it turns the disk on. Okay. A little bit later, the actual drive sends a note. You know, it doesn't interrupt, basically. But at a very low level, it's turned into a message. So get rid of interrupts at a very low level. A message comes into the disk driver saying, you know, hardware interrupt. And then the disk driver goes and reads the registers, finds out you know, if it worked, and then eventually reports back to the file system saying, read completed correctly or there was an error. Um, and then, um, then the user is informed and the, co the copy is done into user space. Okay? So all these are separate processes. And there's a little bit of overhead here. It's like a microsecond. I, mean, we've t I haven't timed it recently, but it's less than a microsecond of overhead. So there is you know, some overhead in the process. But if you're reading from the disk, that's milliseconds. Okay? Even, even a, an SSD is you know, 100, 100 uh, microseconds. So a couple more microseconds here or there isn't going to be the, the real killer. Um, now, what does the reincarnation server do? It's the parent of all the drivers and servers. So it's like up there you know, when the system boots. And you, you know, it, it, I think it's the parent of, uh, it's in the et cetera RC file. So before you start forking off all these servers and drivers, it runs. It's the parent of all the, um, you know, the things, of the, the servers and drivers. And if something dies, it collects it. It's the parent. Okay? And what does it do if some piece dies? It looks up in a table saying, well, what am I supposed to do? And the table typically will say, you know, log it somewhere, maybe send an email to the administrator, and then try to restart it. Okay? And if it's a driver, it'll go to the disk and go get the driver and start a fresh copy. You might ask, what if it's a disk driver? Well, we're clever enough to keep the disk driver in RAM all the time. So if the disk driver dies, we'll take the RAM copy and put it in. And once we have a working disk driver, we can read the rest of them from the disk. Okay? And it also pings the, um, the various servers you know, all the time. So, the uh, reincarnation server will say to the disk driver, hi, disk driver, how you doing? The disk driver will say, great, I did 62 reads in the last second. And then a little bit later, pings the disk driver again, how you doing? And it says, great, I did 104 requests in the last second. Okay? A little bit later, pings it again, says, how you doing? <laughs> then it says, uh, disk driver, how are you doing? All right. I'll give you one more chance. How are you doing? <laughs> so at this point, the reincarnation says, hmm, not doing well. Kills it, goes and starts a new one, and the new one you know, is OK. The other components are told something happened. So if the file server you know, um, was waiting for a request to be completed, it has to record in its tables where it was. Okay? And then it, it's told where the new one is, sends a message to the new one saying, go do the command again. So the commands have to be sort of item potent in order to make this work. But basically, it's doable with a little bit of structuring. So um, you, know, you can't make it transparent to everybody, but you make it reasonably transparent. Okay? So um, disk driver recovery sort of looks like this, basically. So user calls the file system, file system calls disk driver. Now this disk driver crashes. Okay? So the reincarnation server hears about that, because it you know, gets sort of a, the equivalent of, of a sig no child, or it's all, and it says, oh, I'll start a new one, tells the file system about it, that you know, the, the driver crashed, you know, your, your problem. File server has saved the, print, the message it sent to the disk driver. It says, oh, there's a new one. Send the new one the message. And then hopefully the new one does the work and everything's fine. If the new one doesn't do the work, the process will repeat itself long enough until the work finally gets done. Okay? If it's a, a really hard, you know, a hard error, there's something you know, very, very wrong with the code, it probably can't recover. But our experience and everybody's experience is most errors are transient. There's some weird timing combination that causes things to fail. If you run it again, probably it won't happen again. You know, most errors are sort of transient. And so this is <coughs> the whole point about a self-healing system. It detects its own errors, 
and it can correct the errors on its own on the fly. So this is the kind of property we want to have in the system where you can detect and correct your own errors. In the same way, for example, TCP, you know, we'll send the packet out, it'll start a timer. If it hasn't got an acknowledgement when the timer goes off, it says, oh, there's a problem, take the recovery action, send it again. That's an example, you know, of doing this in software for the operating system. And so we've tried to use that as kind of our, our model, okay? So some of the issues about reliability and security. Well, fewer lines of code means fewer kernel bugs. So we don't have as many bugs in the kernel as everybody else because we've got less code. I'm not claiming a better rate, you know, but I'm just claiming less code. Um, so 15,000 lines of code means a smaller trusted computing base. There's no foreign code in the kernel. It's only our code. And other systems, if you get a driver, you have to install a driver written by some kid in Taiwan whose boss was breathing down his neck saying, we got a ship, we got a ship. And the kid says, the code's not ready. And the boss says, I don't care, we got a ship. Okay? It doesn't happen in Minix because there's no kernel, there's no driver code. You know, you get some user process, won't work, but the kernel isn't affected by installing a new driver. We've also been fairly careful about static data structures. There's no malloc in the kernel, which means you sometimes have to overdimension things, but RAM is cheap. And so, you know, we don't have all the problems with malloc and, you know, memory leaks and all that stuff. We don't have that because we don't have any dynamic stuff in the kernel. Moving bugs to user space is what we're doing. Doesn't make them fewer bugs, but it means they're less powerful bugs. Because if you're a bug in an audio driver, you know, or worse yet, you're, you know, a hack in an audio driver, somebody's compromised you, you can make very strange noise, but you can't fork off a new shell because when you try to create a new process. The kernel says, hey, audio driver, you have no permission to create other processes. Sorry, you know, eat no, you know, no perm. You can't do it. And so we reduce the power of the bugs. Okay. Um, fixed length messages, all the messages are 64 bytes. So there's no buffer overruns. You know, you can't have all the problems with buffer overruns. There's a variable length messages. We don't have them. It's a, it's a hard constant, you know, in one of the header files saying buffers are 64 bytes. <laughs> messages are 64 bytes. We had a rendezvous system that A, you know, sent to B, B listened and got the message, we copied it over. But it turns out that has some reliability issues. Namely, if the sender sends it to the, you know, say the, the client sends it to the server, the server um, is trying to do it, the client dies, the server can't respond and everything hangs. So we had to go to an asynchronous scheme even though we like the rendezvous better because there are no lost messages, there's no buffer management. So we had to add asynchronous messages, but we try to avoid using it as much as we can. And we've, we've integrated interrupts and messages that are very, very low level. Interrupts are turned into um, messages. Um, okay. Um, you know, the untrusted code, like drivers, is heavily, you know, protected by the MMU. So our model is, you know, most of the operating system actually is untrusted code. That's kind of a different model than everybody else. So bugs and viruses and whatnot can't spread from one module to another module easily because we assume you know, the starting play, our starting position is that the, um, most of the operating system is untrusted code. You know, the kernel is trusted, but that's very small. Okay. Um, nobody can touch kernel data structures to muck, muck them up. Nobody has permission to write on the kernel. You know, if somebody needed to read the kernel data structure, we, I think we have a couple of system calls where you could read it. It's simply copied into your address space, but you can't write it. Okay. So a lot of the problems, if somebody mucks up you know, a kernel data structure and you're, you're hung, you know, can't happen. Bad pointers, you know, a bad pointer could crash a driver or one component, but it can't crash the kernel because it can't, you know, get at the kernel. Um, infinite loops can be detected if some component is looping and not, you know, paying attention and doesn't answer the ping from the reincarnation server, that's effectively dead, okay, and then it'll be killed and a new one will be started, okay. I, I should say that um, starting things is tricky when there's state, and we're, we're working on that to some extent, but we haven't solved that problem entirely yet. Um, but things that are stateless, and most drivers are stateless, that we can deal with. We just start a fresh copy, okay? Um, but I'll talk more about, you know, state later. So we're restricting the power of bugs to do damage rather than reducing the number, okay? Okay, other advantages of user drivers, well, it's a shorter development cycle. You know, you do something to the thing, you compile it, you run it, doesn't work, okay, you, you can just start a new one. You don't have to reboot the computer, which takes, you know, five minutes. So it's a normal programming model. You start up a process that doesn't work, you know, and you can debug it. There's no, no crash time, there's no reboot. You can use normal debugging type tools. It's just another process, okay? So that makes the whole cycle easier, it's more flexible. We ran a couple of fault, one of my students ran some fault injection experiments. <coughs> um, we injected 800,000 faults into each of three Ethernet drivers. This is done on the binary drivers at runtime. So, 
you know, a, a debugging program some overwrote memory. And we were careful about writing over, we didn't write random numbers into it. We looked for like branch less than, and we change it to branch less than or equal to. And that's the kind of error a programmer might make. You know, so we look for specific errors that programmers might make, and we modified the binary to emulate the kind of errors that actually happen. And um, we inject 100 faults. We waited one second to say if it crashed, if it didn't crash, we inject another 100 faults, and we just keep going. Okay? And we managed to crash drivers 18,000 times. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but we never lost the operating system. Okay? Drivers went up and down all the time. But we never lost the operating system. That's the, the fault tolerance that I think is so important. Okay? Uh, a little while back, I got another, a second uh, advanced, a uh, second uh, ERC grant, and that was about um, sort of trying to make this thing more useful to the outside world. And um, we ported Minix to the ARM. Okay, and so we had to restructure the source tree for multiple architectures. Oddly enough, we had that in Minix one, but it sort of got lost along the way somewhere. Um, we changed the booting to use uBoot uh, for the ARM. We had to rewrite the low-level code dealing with the hardware because you know the MMU works a little differently than the x86. <coughs> we had to change the code for context switching. Some of the very low-level stuff is different on the ARM than the x86. So we had to change some of that. We got rid of the segmentation code since I think Intel has also lost interest in it, and ARM doesn't have it, so we threw it out. <coughs> we gradually began importing the NetBSD ARM headers and libraries because you know NetBSD is fanatic about portability. They really want to make things run on every known platform. So they've really been very careful not to do things like put inline x86 code in the middle of a C program. Is they don't do that kind of stuff. So it was nice and clean. We had to change the, the, the build system to do cross comp compilation because we didn't, we didn't want to build it on an ARM. We wanted to build it on something else. We wrote drivers for the SD card and some of the other Beagle devices. And our initial target was the Beagle Bone and the Beagle Bone Black. And for those of you who don't know it, it's a, a single, it's a PC with an arm on it about the size of a smartphone, small smartphone, okay? And here are some of the characteristics of the Beagle. It's got an ARM V7. Uh, for those of you who, don't, who know it, but the ARMs, the clock runs at a gigahertz. It's got half a gig of RAM in it. It's got four gigs of disk in it, flash memory. Um, it's got HDMI port at 1080p. It's got 92 I.O. pins. You can connect anything you want to have it drive things in embedded systems. 100 megabit Ethernet, it's got a USB port on it, it's open source, which is important, and about $45, maybe $55, depending on which model exactly. There's a couple of models out there. Some of you may know about the Raspberry Pi. If you compare it to the B+, that's got an ARM V6, which is an older and somewhat you know, less good processor. It's at 700 megahertz, also half a gig. Doesn't have any uh, disk memory, doesn't have any disk on it. So that's a problem. <coughs> it's also got 1080p. Um, it's got 40 I.O. pins, 100 megabit Ethernet. It's got four USB ports, which is a plus. On, on the Beagle Black, you'd need a, a hub if you wanted to go to more than one. It's not open source, so that's the main reason we didn't want to touch it. And it's a little bit cheaper. Okay. Okay. So I, I will, I will, I'm willing to admit I'm wrong. I, I've been right a lot, but I've been wrong once in a while. <laughs> um, on January 29th, 1992, I posted to comp.os.minix. Don't get me wrong. I'm not unhappy with Linux. It'll get all the people who want to turn Minix into BSD Unix off my back. Um, so I apologize. And actually, I do want to turn Minix into BSD. <laughs> it just took me 20 years to realize it. I'm sorry about that. I'm kind of slow on the draw here. So <coughs> Minix meets BSD. <laughs> and, The, um, the BSD thing is copyright Kirk, Marshall, Kirk, McCusick, and used by his permission. Okay. Or maybe. <laughs> so why BSD? Um, Minix didn't have enough application software, and BSD is proven, reliable, quality product. And I think the code quality in general is better than, than Linux. Those guys are really fanatic about good code quality, and they don't release things, you know, on this very slow release scale. I mean, there's... Once in a while, there's a new release, and they really test it pretty carefully. It's a little bit different philosophy than Linux. Um, package Source is a really good package manager, and so we really like that. And there are thousands of packages out there. And there's an active community, and also license compatibility. That um, I was keynote speaker at um, Linux conference in Australia a few years ago, and I didn't mention licensing in the talk. Somebody asked me afterwards, what's the license? And I said, it's BSD license. And the audience began cheering. It's a Linux conference. So, you know, I don't know. 
So anyway, we're, we're BSD. Um, why NetBSD? Because it's got a tremendous emphasis on portability. You know, some of the other guys care about security, and you know, but the NetBSD guys care about portability. And if you're running on 80 platforms, you can't have any weird stuff that uses some peculiar feature you know, it's undocumented on the x86 that doesn't fly in 80 platforms. So they've really made an effort to make it really, really clean code. So we, we kind of appreciate that. So anyway, there's a bunch of features um, from uh, NetBSD. We have the, the Clang LLVM compiler. That's a very nice thing. Some of you may know that Linux is not written in C. It's written in GCC. And so <laughs> they can't use, I mean, there have been attempts to use the, the Clang compiler. Uh, we've tried to use, compile Linux with the Clang compiler. There are thousands and thousands of places in the code which are not ANSI standard C. We've got to go patch them. People have attempted to do this. We have never got it working. It's just a disaster. And I think that the moral of the story is write your stuff in ANSI standard C or C++. But you know, then you can use whatever compiler happens to be the best at whatever time. So for us to change from our, our own ACK compiler to Clang was a question of just changing the, the build system to call that compiler and it works right out of the bat, off the bat. And Clang is a very nice compiler, has some very nice properties, which I'll talk about later, as well as producing very nice code. Uh, we adopted the NetBSD build system, we adopted the L file format, the whole source tree dealing with architectures is modeled on the way NetBSD does it. Um, the headers in the libraries are all from NetBSD. It's got X11, you know, it's got package source. Last time I looked, we could build about 5,000 NetBSD packages right out of the box. You just say, you know, make, and everything happens right. Um, some of them don't work because we don't have some font library or there's some other thing. We, we didn't have the time to really tra track it down. But my guess is, with a small amount of effort, you can probably get thousands more packages to work out of the box. You know, there's, there's a few system calls we don't have. Those are actually are impediments. But a lot of the stuff is sort of minor things, like some package needs some peculiar font we don't have, and it requires somebody to spend a day figuring out where, where the font is and how to install it. Um, but a lot of stuff just works out of the box. And nevertheless, we've built Minix on top of, you know, um, you know the NetBSD environment is built on top of, um, of Linux, of um, um, NetBSD is built on top of uh, the Minix environment. So there's some things we don't have. We don't have kernel threads. That's you know long story, but that in the beginning it wasn't there. It was too complicated. We have user land threads, but things that actually require kernel threads, that's a problem. Um, there's some system calls that we're missing. Like we don't have the LWP calls, the message calls, SEM calls. Some might be easy to add. We don't have clone. <coughs> we don't have some of the get and octal calls. We don't have KQ and Ktrace. Ktrace. Don't have vfork. Um, we don't have job control. But it seems to me if you have X11, why would you want job control just under the window? Um, you know, and some minor calls are missing. Nevertheless, we can build over 5,000 packages, so it's you know moderately close. If you're looking for a count of how close it is to um, to NetBSD, there's the QA test. Um, we ran all these tests, and you know, 512 failed, and 2139 passed. And so basically, 81% of the QA tests passed. So it's sort of 81% of the way there. And the things that don't work tend to be the more exotic things. Okay, so it's not all the way there, and some of that requires some work. But we're a large way along, you know, along the road there. So here's the system architecture. Um, the bottom line is the bottom layer is the microkernel, okay? With the stuff running, that's the part that runs in kernel mode, it handles interrupts, and you know loads the registers up and ma physically manages the the page table and so on. Then the next layer is the drivers, all processes. Then come all the servers. All that's just Minix, okay? But in user land, you know we have packages and Clang and all that stuff, and that's NetBSD. So it's NetBSD sort of re-implemented on the Minix infrastructure with the reliability and self-healing properties of Minix, but to the user, it looks like NetBSD. Okay? So we think this is kind of the, the best of you know, at least two possible worlds. You have all the nice reliability properties of Minix, but you have a user interface, which is familiar at least to people who are you know, BSD people. You know, could we have done Linux? Maybe. Could, could it still be done? I think it would be hard, because I don't think it's quite as clean as uh, NetBSD. OK, so here's. Uh, Minix on the on the Beagle boards now. You know you can't read this, but green is good and red is bad. So um, we've tested on three different Beagle boards: uh, the Beagle Bone Black, the Beagle Bone White, and the Beagle Bone XM. And on the black, most of it works. There's a few things like uh, 
the serial peripheral interface bus, we didn't get around to writing a driver for, but those are all things that could be done relatively easy. We just sort of ran out of manpower for them. But most of the stuff on the Beagle board sort of works. Okay, um, your role in all of this. Um, it's now an open source project. Funding has run out. I'm, I'm theoretically retired, although I haven't noticed it yet. Um, and we hope some of you will join us and help do work on it like all the other open source projects around here. And it's an interesting project. You know, we're combining a well-established user land with a somewhat novel and interesting, you know, lower levels with this modularity property. Um, if there are crucial system calls that are missing, people can try to, you know, add them. We don't want to gum things up with, you know, a weird system call that one package somewhere needs and nobody wants to, you know, some game that nobody cares about needs this system call. We were kind of inclined not to want to do that. Um, Certainly porting more packages. We don't have Java, we don't have a browser, we have links, <coughs> but we don't have a graphical browser. Um, you know, I don't know if Firefox would be portable. It's, you know, a very big program. Um, but there might be smaller Dillo, I mean, there's, there's maybe smaller browsers that are graphical that we could, um, could have. Um, you know, there's some missing drivers for the Beagle board. I don't think they're really important, but they might be need. some people might need them. So, you know, that. Um, get it running on other platforms such as the Raspberry Pi and, and you know, other platforms, that would be very nice. Uh, Rump is a project done by some guys in Norway which allows you to use uh, BSD driver, you know, like uh, Windows drivers on, on BSD, it's like an interface between the driver lands and, and the operating system, that might be an interesting project. Um, certainly port libraries and port a GUI, you know, it doesn't have to be KDE but there are other GUIs out there. Um, we had one for a while back but we sort of lost it but some kind of a GUI, all people want to do is click on the icon, basically. Everything else is you know, irrelevant. So if you had some way to show icons on the screen, you could click on an icon and something happens. That's sort of all you need, basically. And there may be simple GUIs out there that do the job. And then general port more you know, of the packages. Um, okay, so here's Minix 3 in a nutshell. Uh, it's a microkernel re-implementation of NetBSD. Didn't start out that way, but it's sort of evolved that way over time. Um, it's fully open source. It's got a BSD license. So, you know, it fits into that piece of the world that's open source and BSD. Um, it's, I say, highly compatible with NetBSD. So people who know NetBSD or FreeBSD will sort of recognize a lot of the stuff. Um, it supports both LLVM and GCC. The default compiler is the LLVM, but GCC is there. If you, want, if you really want to use it, you just type GCC. But um, the normal way to compile things is with LLVM. I'll come to that in a minute. We use the package manager from NetBSD package sort, which is a very nice package manager. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, about 5,000 packages build right out of the box. Uh, you can get it, go to minix3.org and just download it and try it. Works on virtual machines, you can try it on you know, virtual machine of your choice. So how are we positioning Minix now? Uh, one of the things is we want to show that a multi-server operating system with pieces all built of these little components can be made to be reliable. Okay? Um, we want to demonstrate that drivers belong in user mode. Microsoft has figured this out also, that, um, that you know, there's a user driver framework that Microsoft is pushing, and they're encouraging Windows developers to write their drivers in user mode, because they understand the same problem, that this kid in Taiwan writes a driver, and put, they put it in the kernel, it doesn't work, it brings down Windows, and everybody yells at Microsoft, that's not really their fault. You know? And so they would prefer that the driver run in user mode, but it doesn't bring down the operating system, simply they'll get a message saying, you know, printer driver crashed or something like that, but the operating system keeps going. So Microsoft understands this very well. The drivers belong in user mode. Um, you know, high, rel high reliability and fault tolerant applications. There are many applications in the world, especially embedded ones, where reliability is very important. So that's only a focus. Um, you, know, I, you know, there was that $100 laptop project at M MIT. At some point, somebody's going to make a $50 one chip, you know, you know computer, sort of like the Beagle for the third world countries, and it's going to have a small amount of RAM, you know, because RAM you know, makes the chip bigger. And so it's to be size constrained. The Minix doesn't take up, you know, as much RAM as some other systems. You can run it in a, I don't know, <coughs> I think 16 meg is, is the, sort of the, the smaller size. We're, we're focused on embedded systems, but also, you know, it runs on virtual machines on the desktop, for example. We'll play with it. There's a feature that's not in the system yet. But we're working on it. We hope to get it out there in the next release. But it's not quite working yet. It's a long story. Is live update. Okay. So software is updated for a variety of reasons. For example, to fix bugs. That's a very common reason. Um, 
to improve performance. Somebody tweaked something, made it faster. That's fine. Uh, you want to add new features, um, you know. And we're, the goal is to update the operating system in real time without rebooting. Okay. So you know, you, your attitude may be, well, you know, so I can reboot. Okay. I just hit the button and it reboots. Okay. If you're running a nuclear reactor, you know. Taking down the control system for five minutes while you're rebooting turns out is not a popular thing to do. They tend not to like that. Okay, so there are plenty of applications where they really don't want to go down ever, basically, in the face of constant updates. And so live update allows you to update the operating system without affecting the application programs currently running. If you're running a web server and you reboot the operating system, guess what? Your web server goes down and forgets everything it's doing, and you've got no servers for a little while. And we're trying to avoid that. We have update in place while it's running. Okay? And, and furthermore, the new operating system version may have some different data structures. So the old version may have used a linked list for something or other, and the new version they're using a hash table. You know? So you can't just you know, copy things over. You've got to move the state from the old one to the new one, because you know, it may have changed. There's some struct that's got a new member in the middle. So you just can't copy the bits over. It's much more complicated than that. And it tends to be a lot of state. You know, there's, open files and timers and all manner of things. You've got to be able to update those things, okay? So here's an example of how this might work. So suppose you've got a patching running on, I don't know, FreeBSD 10.1 or whatever, and what you want is Apache is still running and now you're running FreeBSD 10.2, okay? So you've changed the operating system and the application is still there. It'll be a very short period of time <coughs> excuse me, um, when the application freezes, because you know, while you're actually doing the update, nothing happens. But that's only you know like half a second or something like that. Okay, um, so the goal is to replace the operating system while the user processes are running. This is very hard to do with BSD or Linux or Windows or other operating systems, and we think we can do it. And we have it running in the lab, which it's not in the current release. So here's like live update in Minix. You know, you're running say Apache, and you've got file system 6.0 running initially. When you're all done, you've got file system 7.0 running, and it's a different version. You know, it's got new stuff in it. <coughs> so how do we do uh, the update? Well, um, there's some manager process which tells, say, the old file system, hey, we want to update you. Okay? So what it does is it says, oh, I better finish off all the work that I'm in the middle of, because it's doing you know, operations with various other pieces and you know, waiting for you know, other processes to respond to it. So it makes sure it finishes all of those. So there's nothing sort of in the middle. If new work comes in, it just queues the messages, saves them in RAM, but it doesn't begin processing them at all. It just keeps them in a buffer somewhere. And sooner or later, everybody who, you know, it was currently interacting with has said, I'm done. So there's no work pending with other servers. And all the incoming work has been queued. And at that point, you know, it can tell the, um, the manager, okay, I'm done, I'm ready to be updated. So the manager then says, okay, I'll create another new process, a new file system, as a separate process with the new code in it as another process. So now you've got the old one in theory running, although it's not being scheduled right now, and then the new one is there, but it isn't you know, running yet. So that's where you, know, you are initially. Now, uh, inside <coughs> the new file system, in fact, inside the old file system, are all kinds of tables listing every data object there. That's one of the things that we really like about LLVM. It's programmable. You can write new passes for it. There's a whole infrastructure for writing your own pass to LLVM. So we wrote a pass which simply collects all the information about all the data structures and puts it in a table in RAM in a certain place, and there's a pointer to it somewhere, that lists every single data structure, where it is, what type it is, how big it is, all that stuff is in a table somewhere. So the file system, both the old one and the new one, know where all of its data structures are, because there's a, ta a table listing it exactly. Okay, That's very important. You can't do that with GCC. The new file system knows which variables and data structures it needs. So it goes to the old one, sends it a message, and says, hey, I need this variable x. Give me the variable x. And the old one then replies, here's x. And then the new one says, OK, next thing I need is y. And so it goes and gets y. And it just keeps asking you know, one after another for um, everything it needs. If it turns out that some data structure has changed in an important way, like what used to be a linked list is now you know, a hash table, then the new version has to have conversion routines to convert from the old to the new. Okay? So the assumption is the guy writing the new one wants the conversion to work, knows how the old one worked, 
knows you know, what the data structure used to be and what it is now, and then it gets the old version of it. Internally, it does a conversion to the new format and puts the new one you know, in place, okay, and then asks the next one. So these are actively cooperating. Okay, so the assumption is these are not hostile. This is the, the same guys who wrote the old one wrote the new one, and they want the conversion to work. When all the state is transferred, then we create a third file system. And it runs the process backwards. It talks to the new one and gets all the state and tries to recreate the old state from the new one. Okay? Um, if that works, then we're probably in business. Okay? This is somewhat analogous to using Google Translate to translate English into German and then translate the German back into English. And if the English you got you know, the second time around is more or less the same as what you started with, it's a reasonable bet that the German was sort of more or less right because you probably couldn't have gotten the right English if the German was all off. Okay? So it's not going to be perfect, but if it's sort of more or less the same, you know, so we make that check. And if it's not the same, it's easy to kill. We kill off the new file system. We go revert back to the old one. The update is aborted. And the old one continues to run. So the system is still running. It just, you know, the update didn't take. And, and a message is sent somewhere saying we, we didn't make it. OK? Um, OK, so how does the, um, the update work? Here's, let's say, Apache is running and the old file system is running. And somebody says, OK, get ready. We're going to update you. The new one has started, new file system. The file system says to the old one, I need some variable x. Gets an answer, you know, here's x. Repeats that, you know, a whole bunch of times. Gets everything. Then this third file system, whatever you call it, starts up. It says, I need x. You know, it gets x. And then it compares itself to the original one. And if they match up, we're in business. Everything works. And we go forward. And if they don't match up, if they don't match up, then um, you know, uh, we abort the update and you know, we continue running the old one. Nothing is lost, except the update didn't work. You know. um, some of you may have heard of case splice. This was done at MIT, actually, by one of my former students, Franz Kosslick, and his student. Um, they can sort of update Linux in real time. However, they can only handle very small security patches, a couple of lines of code. You know, something wrong, they put in a branch at the place where there's a problem, branch to somewhere else, put in the new code, and branch back skipping over the old code that didn't work. So very, they can't handle major data structures change or anything like that. Um, and it, so it patches the running process. Okay? But over time, CRUD kind of accumulates in the process because you know, the, when the second patch happens, it's somewhere else. The other patch is still there, and that is another jump somewhere else. Over a period of a year, it's gonna be, memory's going to be full of these little patches. Okay? And um, there's also, if something goes wrong with the patch, there's no way to recover. You know, in our case, you know, we, we do the check. If it doesn't work, we just kill off the, you know, the, the new version of, say, the file system, and we go back to running the old one, and we're back to where we were, and no harm is done. We just don't do the update. Okay? If they have a problem with the update, everything crashes. So it's really a much better scheme than that. There are also there are some other interesting uses of live update. Um, for example, there's a lot of um, security problems where the attacker basically knows the layout of memory very accurately and does something like, you know, it creates a gadget for a return to libc kind of attack or something like that where, you know, it does a buffer overflow attack and it overwrites, you know, the stack in such a way when the current function returns, the return address has been overwritten to a jump into the buffer that overflowed and there is a piece of code that, um, you know, does whatever the attacker is trying to do. And to make that work, you have to have a very, very detailed knowledge of exactly the layout of memory. Okay? Um, we could do an update of the operating system at a very high frequency, just changing it in random ways to, for the purpose of foiling that attack. Because the attack only works if you know what memory layout looks like. If we've got you know, dozens of different memory layouts and we're changing them all the time, you know, it's very hard for somebody to you know, they can guess what the memory layout is. If they guess wrong, it's going to jump randomly, and you're going to get a crash. Okay? But a crash is much better than having your system being taken over. So it turns uh, this kind of return to libc type you know, attack into a crash rather than a takeover. So that, that I think, is a, a huge advantage from a security um, point of view. It also, because you don't know what memory looks like, they can't steal information easily, because the place they think it is, it isn't there. It's somewhere else. Okay? Um, it's also possible to do garbage collection in C 
You wouldn't think you could do it. But remember, the way it works is you start a new version. The new one has a list of what it wants. It fetches all the things it needs. Lost memory that nobody's using doesn't get copied over, OK? Because nobody ever asked for it. So um, when it's all done, it's copied over all the things it actually needs. It doesn't copy over junk that you know, there's no pointer to anymore. If there's no pointer to some piece of memory you malloced a long time ago, it doesn't get copied over, and only the things that are currently active. So effectively, it's garbage collection. It eliminates memory leaks, even though you're programming in C. And the programmer doesn't have to know about it. It happens automatically. That's kind of an unusual thing, because only the live data is copied over. Um, OK, so this can fix memory leaks. Now, another research thing, which I don't think is going to make it into the code because of, of timing, is fault injection. Um, there's a lot of, you know, if you claim your system is faster than somebody else's, it's pretty easy to test that. Okay? If you claim it's more reliable, it's not so easy to test that. And so we're working on testing reliability. And how do we do that? Um, you know, we inject a fault you know, at runtime. We have um, compiled in two versions of every basic block. There's the real one and the faulty one. And then there's a test before the basic block of should I run the faulty block or the real block? Okay? So we have all this code. And this is generated automatically by the LLVM compiler. Again, we programmed a pass to inject false as we wish. So the new program structure doesn't have basic blocks, but got these little extra blocks with the test go this way or go that way. So we have a single binary where we can run all kinds of different tests without having to recompile it. So we can run a whole bunch of different kinds of tests without um, doing a recompilation, which means we can do it very quickly. So we can run lots and lots of tests using this uh, fault injection technique. And we can optimize the whole thing to produce a single binary to, um, to do it. And the overhead for doing this is about uh, 8% that we measured it. So it's not, it's not very much. Um, so it gives us a whole playground. We've written lots of papers about it. Um, you, you know, if you look up um, Eric von de Kawa, my, my PhD student, he's written and published a bunch of papers and got the best paper awards for this. It's, it's very cool. Cool kind of stuff. Um, OK, we have a logo. It's a raccoon. We have sort of two logos. Sometimes we use the full logo. Sometimes only the raccoon's face. Um, why a raccoon? Well, it seems that a lot of operating systems have something of an animal logo. It seems to be kind of a thing to do. Um, they're small. They're not that small, but they're sort of smallish. Um, they're cute. <laughs> they're very clever. Um, they're very agile, like an open garbage cans with their little hands, you know. Um, they eat bugs. That's <laughs> and um, they're probably more likely to visit your house than a <laughs> unless you live in Antarctica. <laughs> Raccoons are very common in North America. OK, we have a website. Minix3.org, here's a snapshot of the website. Um, the documentation's in a wiki, so you can help us document things. Sometimes people ask, I can't program, can I help? And I say, yeah, you can, you can help document things. Um, so you can help document the system. There's you know, wiki and everything about the system is in the wiki, how to use it, how to be a developer, all that stuff is in there. Here's um, some stats about the traffic. Now, it's a little bit old, but basically, we were running you know, about 20,000 visits a month to the website. We've been doing this for over 10 years. There was a big spike in September of last year when the new, re new release came out. We were on Slashdot. We had about 80,000 hits. Um, the number of downloads that we've had since I began logging it in 2007 is about 650,000. This is a conservative estimate. I've been fairly careful about not counting spiders and all kinds of other stuff. And so we've been having something like, we've had something like 650,000 downloads. So it's surprising, I mean, for you know, small academic project, that's quite a few. Um, Downloads, I think. We have a news group. You know, some people say I should do this on Facebook, but it seems like most serious developers know about Google groups. It just seems a much more appropriate place to talk than Facebook. So I don't know, we have a Google news group. It's on the front page, it says for group, click here, you know, and people can ask questions and, and you know, discussions and whatnot. So anyway, the, um, the conclusion is I think current operating systems are kind of bloated and unreliable. Uh, Minix 3 is an attempt to produce a reliable and secure operating system. Uh, the kernel is very small. It's about 15,000 lines of code. Um, the operating system runs as a collection of user processes. Uh, each driver is a separate process. 
Each operating system component has restricted privileges. There's, you know, for, for every kind of thing it might want to do, like what other processes can I talk to? What kernel calls can I make? Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. There are bitmaps and tables inside the kernel that describe what it's allowed to do. So if a component, you know, makes a kernel call, and the kernel calls are different than the POSIX calls, but that's handled at a much higher level. The kernel first checks, is this allowed? If it's allowed, then it does it. If it's not allowed, it sends back a message saying no permission. Okay, so there's a very fine grain, you know, control over what a component can do. Faulty drivers can be replaced automatically. Some um, stateful servers can be replaced automatically, but only the ones where the state changes slowly currently. For example, an audio driver has a little bit of state, you know, the, the bass and treble levels and, you know, volume and that kind of stuff. And a, a driver, you know, or any component with slowly changing state, whenever its state changes, can send a message to the data store saying, please save my state, okay, and it saves it. And when a new version comes up, first thing it does is go to the data store and say, give me my state. And, it, you know, it gets its state and then it can put the state back where it was. For things like the file system where it changes very rapidly, we've got other techniques which we're still working on. I'm not sure if they're going to get in there. Okay. Um, live update is possible. We have it working in the lab. It's not on the current release. We're trying to get that to happen. There's some coiner cases that we haven't got, got right yet, but we're pretty sure it's doable. Um, uh, when you, if you download Minix from <coughs> the website, give it a try, and there's a survey on the main page. We're, um, we have 650,000 downloads, but we don't know who the users are. We don't know what they're doing. And um, we'd like to sort of find out. You know, that's one of the disadvantages of the BSD license is um, we don't know what people are doing. That there's a talk at 2 o'clock from some people are using Minix for something. I didn't know about it, you know. And, you know, that's one of the advantages of the GPL. You sort of hear, or maybe you don't hear, you know. They're using the GPL. They post the source changes as they're supposed to, but they don't tell anybody about it. But they're there. If you look, you find it. But it's not announced anywhere publicly. But, so we don't know who they are. So we're kind of trying to find that out. And we're trying to build a community. And we're thinking of having a conference next year. I don't know. Uh, wild idea. We're going to hold some kind of a, whatever our conference means. There's sort of two ways we could do it. Um, we're thinking of having maybe a dev room at FOSDEM in Brussels, because a lot of people from this community and other communities go to FOSDEM, which is an interesting conference. Or you know, if we don't get a dev room or it doesn't look like the right thing, we might hold a small conference in Amsterdam you know, the, sort of the day before FOSDEM or the day after it for people who are coming from far away, anybody coming from, say, the US. You know, once you've come to Brussels, you can come to Amsterdam, you know, it's, it's only a small increment. If you're, if you're coming from Spain, it's, you know, it's two separate trips. But all right, we're thinking of doing it. Um, can I have a show of hands of how many people might be interested in coming to such a conference, one, one place or other? A small number. I mean, we're not expecting you know, vast numbers, but if 30 people showed up, that, that could be quite a successful conference. We're trying to build a community. And it, it's hard to do. It's, it's, you know, I, mean, I don't know how many of you have have some piece of software where you're trying to build a new community for it. It's not so easy. Uh, just a little ad here. We have a, a master's program at the Free University. If you're a student in computer su systems and you're interested in parallel or distributed systems, um, look for our web. Go Google me. That's the, that's the fastest thing. <laughs> look at my homepage. There's a link to it. There's a movie about it. There's a video there about our, our master's program. It's a research-focused master's program. In most of the people who've gotten the masters, have gone on and gotten a PhD somewhere. That's sort of a very common, it's a very research-oriented kind of program. So if you're, in a, if you're a, you know, a, an undergraduate and you want to get a master's and get a PhD later, this might be an interesting uh, program. Or look at PDCS, Parallel and Distributed Computer Systems, .food.nl. And that's the end. And I made it on time. Actually, it's kind of um, two questions wrapped up in one. Given the fact that you are kind of working on this almost 30 years, um, what would you have to, the two most important things that you would have done differently? And given the fact that you are aiming at embedded systems, maybe there is some industrial interest in the project? Thanks. Um, 
I wrote a paper called Lessons from 30 Years of Minix, which describes exactly that. It's been accepted by the communications of the ACM. It's in the pipeline for publication now. Um, it'll be a number, they're, they're kind of behind all the time. It'll be published there eventually, and that goes through lessons learned, you know, in many different spaces in great detail. You know, I, I'd be hard pressed, I mean, knowing what I know now, I'd say, gee, we should have kernel threads, but that makes, makes a much more complicated system, so I'm not sure if I would do it. Um, you know, the, the main thing I think I would do, this is, this is maybe ridiculous, but the main thing I think I would do differently is when we switched from Minix 2 to Minix 3, I would have renamed it something other than Minix because too many people used it in a course in college long ago and think, oh, Minix is an educational system. It's not a real system, okay? But it is a real system now. It just wasn't a long time ago. But nobody knows that because they, they associate Minix with their college course. And I had a friend who was in advertising, and she said, never throw away a famous brand name. But maybe it would have been good to throw away a famous brand name and pick some new name so people wouldn't associate it with the educational system, which it once was. Um, does that sort of answer? What was the second, second part? Yeah, I mean, again, the question is, you know, are there industrial applications? Are we talking to companies? We, we were at um, Embedded World in Nuremberg t two times. That's the biggest embedded systems fair in Europe. We were there two times. We had a stand and so on. We talked to many, many customers, and it was, um, a lot of them were very interested. They liked the open source. For example, we had guys who make trains. And they said, you know, a train lasts, you know, 60 years. We got to have the source code because we don't know if that company's going to be around in 60 years. We got to be able to maintain it ourselves or hire somebody to do it. And how big is your company? You know, will you be around for a while? And we didn't have a company yet, but we can't get a company until we had customers. And we can't get customers until we had a company. And so, you know, there's this a vicious circle. So there was a lot of industrial interest, but it sort of, you know, didn't pan out because we weren't big enough. And maybe if I were 30 years younger, I would try to get, you know, venture capital and, and sort of do it the right way. But so I'm not against other people want to pick up the ball and go that direction. That would be fine. We have a Minix Foundation, and we're trying to make it go as an open source project now. So I, we know that there's industrial interest in the sense that many people came to our stand at Embedded World, and they liked a, lo a long list of the properties, the self-healing, you know. like. Guys who make thermostats, they're all, it's an iPad glued to your wall now, right? And, and it's on the internet. I mean, these people can hack your house. So they're worried about, you know, real-time updates to it. They're worried about security, all these things. But, you know, because we weren't a company, they, they couldn't start it, but we couldn't start it because, we, you know, we didn't have customers. And it's, you know, that whole sort of vicious circle. And it took more time and effort and funding to get, you know, that started. So we, we weren't able to pull it off, but I'm certainly not against other people trying to do that. So there is industrial interest, we know that, but we just weren't, weren't able to pull it off, you know, basically, you know, in a very short uh, time frame. 